Well, good morning once again. I'm thankful to be uh, opening God's Word with you. We are um, we're continuing in our series in Luke's Gospel, and Lord willing, we've got two more sermons in Luke before we take a pause for a while. Uh, we're, we're gonna, the timing is perfect. We will hit uh, a section break there in Luke where uh, Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem. And so, Lord willing, today, next week, and the following week, the plan is to, to finish up this, this section in Luke's Gospel. And then, believe it or not, in three weeks, it's Christmas Eve. It's amazing how uh, the, the older I get, the, more I, the faster I feel life going, right? Uh, it's just that way, I guess. And so uh, it seemed like when I was a kid, it was forever before Christmas got here, and now it's like I blink and it's that time. So, uh, Lord willing, in three weeks, um, we'll uh, do something Christmas-specific, and then, of course, we have our Christmas Eve service that evening over in our chapel, and I look forward to being with you for our Christmas Eve service that Sunday evening. Uh, I do want to thank Brother Rob for uh, preaching last week. And uh, both Mark and I had opportunity to listen to uh, Brother Rob's message and, uh, again, appreciate this dear brother uh, filling the pulpit. Uh, There is something periodically from time to time, as much as I love opening God's Word with you and preaching, periodically there is, uh, it is nice to uh, kind of be in your position and to uh, attend a church service and hear someone else preach. Uh, And so Pastor Mark um, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to visit a sister church in the Indianapolis area, and I know everybody knows we went to a football game last week, and that's cool. We had a good time, uh, but we did uh, attend a church service beforehand, and it was really a blessing. Um, Bryce and Samantha, uh, Pastor Mark's daughter and, and son-in-law, uh, we were able to attend a, a service with them in the Indianapolis area, and uh, just a blessing to uh, to be with my sons and uh, one of my closest friends, uh, Pastor Mark, and so... Um, I feel blessed. I know I gush on Mark a lot, um, and he's watching online this morning, so Mark, don't get a big head if you're watching and saying, seeing this, but uh, we are so blessed to have Pastor Mark. Um, I, I really be- I believe that um, uh, Mark was already here. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, God brought Mark here, but well before I got here, uh, I think he's been here since the 1880s, if I remember right, and so... Um, <laughs> 1980s actually. Mark's a blessing and um, uh, he's sick this morning as I said and he had some surgery this last week so uh, certainly lift up Mark uh, this week as he recovers. He's, uh, he's in bad shape this morning but Lord willing he'll, uh, he'll pop back and we'll see him next week. So, All right, well I tell you what, I'm going to pray and we're going to dive into our message this morning here in Luke 18. Father, thank you again. You, you are so gracious to us. Even as we sang these Christmas songs this morning, focused on the birth of the Savior and what that means, the spiritual significance of this. It's a historical event, but with uh, un, un, uh, unimaginable spiritual significance. E- even the words of the last song that we sang, uh, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. And uh, Lord, those of us who know Christ this morning are the recipients of that great and glorious gift. Uh, you're a good God, and we see that in our passage this morning. Pray that you give us uh, fresh ears and a fresh uh, mind to hear this today, and that as a result of listening and uh, meditating on this passage this morning, uh, we would desire you even more. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. In 2004, uh, a doctor declared a Wisconsin man named Lawrence Pop to be legally blind. And so Pop then proceeded to apply for disability benefits from the Social Security Administration, claiming that he was unable to work any longer. And he was approved and he began to receive said benefits. Uh, which continued for a number of years and ultimately amounted to uh, nearly $200,000 in, uh, in benefits. But there was a problem, and that problem was that Lawrence Pop was not blind. It wasn't clear from the articles that I read about Mr. Pop 
uh, why federal authorities began to suspect that something wasn't right. There was some red flag at some point in something that Mr. Pop said or did, uh, but at some point they began to suspect that he was committing fraud. And so they began to monitor his activities. And here's some of what they discovered. They discovered in monitoring him that he could drive a car. And so remember, this man is supposedly blind and he could drive a car. In fact, uh, there's video you can watch online where uh, they actually kind of did a stakeout outside his house waiting for him when they knew he had a, an appointment at the Social Security Administration, watched him get in his car, drive to the Social Security meeting, then the video cuts to a video of the actual interview with someone at Social Security who then asked him point blank, have you driven or do you drive? And he said no, as he had driven to the appointment and parked around the corner. Then the guys were waiting for him outside and watched him get back in his car and drive off. Not, 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 a, not good for a blind man. He also could drive a motorboat. And there's video of that as well, of him driving complete with the water skier towing behind him. He could drive a snowmobile. Apparently this guy was an expert at driving all sorts of uh, modes of transportation. He also worked, which he said he was unable to do. He ran multiple businesses, and that actually ended up in the end adding to his legal woes because he said he couldn't work, but he was working, and so therefore he was earning money and not reporting that as income, and so he was in trouble not only with Social Security, but also with the IRS. Uh, because he was not reporting those tax, uh, taxes owed there. And then above and beyond this, uh, he lived a lavish lifestyle. And so he was vacationing during that time period repeatedly in the Cayman Islands. And he would buy expensive jewelry for his wife, including a $25,000 diamond and emerald necklace. Uh, now I'm sure with inflation, it's probably worth a lot more. This is, you know, probably... 15 years ago or so, whenever he purchased this, um, even at today's prices, I still can't imagine buying my wife a 25K diamond and emerald necklace. Probably, sorry, Melinda, that's not going to happen. Well, needless to say, the federal authorities had an abundance of evidence against Mr. Pop, and he ended up being sentenced to a year in federal prison for his, uh, his deceit there. And now, that was almost 10 years ago. I tried to search for Mr. Pop online and see, uh, he was convicted about 10 years ago. Uh, I, I have no idea what he's up to these days. Apparently he's keeping a pretty low profile if he still is in fact alive. Um, so I don't know what he's doing, but to those he, who knew his situation, Lawrence Pop will be remembered as the blind man who saw. Now today's passage also features a blind man who saw. Uh, there's no fraud or anything going on in the, this instance. We have a genuinely blind man who has a dramatic encounter with the Lord Jesus in this text. And afterward, he was able to see. It's amazing and it's entirely consistent with what we've already seen of the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry. We've seen Jesus perform all sorts of healings, casting out demons, doing all these sorts of things. And so if you recognize that Jesus has the ability to perform miracles, which of course the Gospels tell us he did, uh, then this is kind of par for the course. Jesus heals a blind man. It's something we've almost come to expect. But in our study of Luke, one of the things I've been trying to, to help us see is that occasionally it's good to zoom out a bit too and see what the author is doing in the book when we look at this passage kind of as a comparison and contrast to some of the passages around it. And I think if we do that, we'll get a fuller sense of what Luke is communicating to his readers. And if we do that, I think what we're going to see here this morning is that the blind man actually saw even before he was healed. In a different sense, not in a deceitful way like Mr. Pop, because physically he was blind, but in contrast to what we've seen in the last few times here in Luke, in contrast to the rich young ruler, and in contrast to Jesus' own disciples, this blind man saw some things that no one else saw. So we're going to examine that when we get there this morning. Well, let, let's get to the first point this morning. And we're going to talk about physical sight. Jesus healed a blind beggar. That, 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 that's the most obvious takeaway from this passage. If you were just skimming this passage 
or if you were reading this in a children's Bible, what would be the message there? Jesus heals a blind beggar. That's pretty obvious, of course. Uh, It's pretty straightforward. Jesus encounters this beggar along the road. Uh, He asks for his sight, and Jesus gives it to him. It does benefit us, though, to look at some of the details a bit more closely. and We do try to do that here on Sunday mornings. So look with me at verse 35. Verse 35, we read, As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now there's several things to note there, to unpack there. As we've been working through Luke, we've seen that Jesus has been on this meandering journey towards Jerusalem. All the way back in chapter 9, Luke told us that Jesus had set his face, or he was determined to go to Jerusalem, knowing what awaited him there. And then he, he was on this kind of, again, it was a meandering journey. It wasn't a beeline. He went lots of places. It's not a straight line journey. But now he's getting to the point where he's on the home stretch. And so it makes perfect sense that he would come to Jericho the way he was approaching the city. Jericho being roughly 15 to 20 miles away. And so it, it makes perfect sense if you're traveling, if you're coming from the northeast, that you would go through Jericho on your way to Jerusalem. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this this morning, but I do want to go ahead and mention, if you read this passage and you read the parallel passages in Matthew and Mark, there are some, uh, some interesting uh, differences in the passages, and it's something for us to ponder uh, just a bit this morning. In verse 35, we're told here that Jesus was approaching Jericho. But in the parallel accounts in Matthew 20 and in Mark 10, we're told that this took place as Jesus was leaving Jericho. In addition, Matthew's Gospel says that there were actually two blind men and not just one. And so, what do we do with these things? Do do we call these out as errors in the biblical text? Do we assume that maybe Luke or Matthew or someone got their facts wrong? Hopefully you already know what I'm going to say. This Sunday actually marks eight years that we've been here at Rikers Ridge. It wasn't December 3rd, it was actually December 6th, I went back and looked, 2015, Uh, but we've been here, it was the first Sunday in December, eight years we've been here, and I hope that at at this point, after eight years, you know that I'm not going to come up here and say, you know, there's errors in the biblical text. Uh, To the core of my being, I believe in the truth of God's Word, and I hope you do as well. So that is not the answer, and if that's the case, then there's some other solution Uh, that we need to look at. So then what is going on here? We don't want to just duck these questions. Uh, If we have confidence in the truth of God's Word, then there must be some solution. If you uh, you want to get deeper into this, there is an article on the website Got Questions, and that is a useful website. Um, There's also a number of articles in in books uh, and journals and whatnot about this. Let me just touch on it very briefly. As far as the leaving versus approaching Jericho, Jericho is a city that at numerous times in the, 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 the period of history covered by Scripture was built and rebuilt. So if you remember your history of the Bible, uh, something happened at Jericho way back in the time of Joshua. You remember the Israelites came into the land after Moses died, and the first city that they come to happens to be the city of Thank you. Steve's paying. I know, at least I know Steve Brown is paying attention. Thank you, brother. He came to the city, uh, they came to the city of Jericho, yes. And so they march into the land. You remember they march around the city uh, all those times and they blow the trumpets and then the walls fall down and the city is destroyed. Later in uh, the book of 1 Kings, we see that the Jericho was rebuilt at that time. And apparently, archaeologists say that Jericho was built and rebuilt several times throughout its history, and not necessarily in exactly the same location. And so it is possible that Jesus was both approaching and leaving Jericho. If he was leaving the the, the old Jericho and coming to the new Jericho, that's probably the most plausible solution that I read. There are some other options, uh, but there is some way to reconcile this. Now, As far as the two versus the one blind men, uh, the the, the simple answer is apparently there were two, but one was more dominant and well-known. And in fact, in Mark's gospel, we actually see this blind man named. We have no name here, but in Mark's gospel, you may even have a heading. My Bible has a heading that says, Bartimaeus receives sight, 
and I don't actually see Bartimaeus' name here. Well, they're getting that from Mark's gospel. Now, even Bartimaeus is, is not, that's more like a last name. Um, they didn't use last names the way we, they usually would say so-and-so son of so-and-so or so-and-so daughter of so-and-so. And so Bar simply means son of, and in fact in, Luke, in Mark's gospel, it says Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, almost a repetition. And so it would almost be like he encountered Crouch, a blind beggar, right? That's, so his name, at least his, his surname, if you want to call it that, would be Bartimaeus. Apparently, he probably would have been more well-known, but there was another guy hanging out with him. And so, again, that's the easiest way to reconcile that. Well, again, I can talk to you about it later if you're curious about those things. There are, the, the only reason I bring that up is this. When we encounter things like this in God's Word, there are answers. There are answers. We don't need to allow these things to shake our confidence in the Scriptures. Oh, no, there's an error in God's Word. There's not. There's ways to reconcile these things. Well, we read here in verse 35 that the blind man was sitting by the road begging. Uh, now, if someone was blind, there are various options, uh, both, uh, even as I said earlier, there's, there could be potential government options, uh, there's charitable options, there's work opportunities for people who are blind, things that people can do now if you're blind that back then did not exist. If you were blind or deaf or lame in that day, probably you were going to resort to begging in order to make ends meet. And so uh, somehow you've got to survive, and so many people that were disabled in that day would, would beg. So it's not uncommon that you would have a blind man sitting by the side of the road begging, and that's what Jesus encounters here in verse 35. But the man was not deaf. He was blind, but he was not deaf. And so he hears this large crowd coming, and he gets curious about what's going on. Verse 36, now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And that's normal, whether you can see or not, or if you're just hearing, if there's a large group of people, there's some commotion, usually you're going to get curious about what it is. How many times have you been in your house and you hear some kind of noise outside, what do you do? You go to the window and look and see what's going on, right? And so he's there, he's begging, and he hears the, this, this crowd, so he inquires what's happening. In verse 37, he's told that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now, apparently, he, he knew of Jesus of Nazareth. Apparently, he had heard. Now, at this stage, again, remember, Jesus is on the home stretch, headed towards Jerusalem. We're almost to what we celebrate around Easter time uh, with, with uh, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. We're getting close to that historically. So Jesus has been on the scene ministering in this larger region for roughly three years. So at some point, uh, this blind man has heard of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so he, he recognizes to some degree who he is. And so he cries out with a loud voice, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now that's really significant what he says. And we're going to talk about that under the second sermon point. Uh, because we need to kind of pick that apart a little bit. But I want to kind of just bypass that, because again, we're going to get to that under the second point. Now, you remember a while back, it wasn't that long ago, we looked at a text here in Luke 18, where people were pr trying to bring their small children, even their babies, to Jesus. And you remember the disciples tried to shoo them away. Don't bother him. He does not have time for your, your children. Come on, don't do that. And so the same sort of thing happens here in verse 39. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. And so it's not hard to imagine what they would say. Oh, come on, Jesus is a busy man. He's got a large following. He's doing all this. He does not have time for you. you know, get, get back in your place. Leave him alone. And so they're trying to shoo him away. But, but this, this guy was not going to have any of that. And so he doesn't say, okay, I'll get back in my place. Look what he says in verse 39. It says, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He's not having any part of that. He knows that Jesus is coming, and he's going to try to get his attention. He's going to keep at it. Jesus, Son of David. It kind of reminds me of the first time that Melinda left the apartment, uh, actually with each of my first two kids, when the first time she left me alone with the kids. Right? I, no matter what I did, I could not get them to stop crying. 
It didn't matter. I, I remember this happened with John Michael, and it happened with John Michael and Ben. She leaves, and I'm like, okay, this is going to go all right, I think, maybe. And it's crying, 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 crying. Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? Calling her, what do I do? Try this. Nope, not working, not working. No matter what I did, they kept crying. The second time, I, one of them's on the floor, one of them's screaming, and I'm panicking. Like, oh, what do I do? I had a hard enough time with one, now what do I do with two? And it's just you can't stop them. They just keep crying and crying. I called for backup on that one, too. Sometimes you just can't get him to stop. And here with Bartimaeus, this blind man, you couldn't, no one could stop him. He was going to say, just like my boys were saying, Mom, have mercy on us. Why did you leave us with Dad? <laughs> Bartimaeus is saying, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. He's going to get Jesus' attention as much as he possibly can. He's going to try. Well, you remember earlier in Luke 18 when the disciples tried to stop people from bringing their children to Jesus. Jesus wasn't having any of that. In fact, he rebukes the disciples. I think it's Mark's gospel tells us he actually he was indignant. He got angry with them. He said, why are you trying to stop them from bringing these children to me? And the same thing happens here. They try to, they try to shush him. They try to tell him, stop. And Jesus is not going to have any of that. Jesus will make time for Bartimaeus. And here's something we learn about Jesus from this, and I hope you're seeing this as we're going through Luke's gospel. Jesus loves people that the world sees as insignificant. He does. And the world looks at Bartimaeus and they're saying, oh, this guy's a blind beggar. He does, he's too important to have time for you. And Jesus says, uh-uh, uh-uh. Stop the, stop the parade. We're stopping this. Go get him and bring him here. And so Jesus hears him, and he's going to intentionally connect with him, just like he did with the children. Jesus cares and has compassion for those who are seen as insignificant by the world. It's 1 Corinthians 1. We've read it countless times in here. So Jesus calls for the blind man to be brought to him. And then in verse 41, Jesus does an amazing thing. In verse 41... It says, uh, Jesus questioned him. It says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? There was one commentator that kind of paused in his exposition of this passage and dwelt on this for a while. You think about that. Jesus, the Son of God, God in human flesh, calls for this blind beggar to come. And in the question that Jesus asks him is, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What would you say? Uh, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know if there was a dramatic pause there in verse 41 or not. We were not told if there's you know, some kind of pause there while Bartimaeus thinks about it. I, I, I kind of doubt it. It seems like he already knew what he wanted, of course. He says, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. I want to regain my sight. Now just a, a, a note from the text there. I know some English translations kind of obscure that. It does appear from the Greek word, tra if you translate that there, that he was seeking to regain his sight. So uh, unlike the man in John's gospel who was born blind, apparently this, this man at one point had had his sight. At this point, he's lost his sight. E either way, he's blind now. And he knows what he wants. He wants his sight back. This man was blind until he met Jesus. Until he met Jesus. My friends, that changed everything. He has an encounter with Jesus and everything has changed. Verse 42, Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. His encounter with Jesus left him a changed man. Now, I've told you numerous times, and I know I, I'm trying to stress these things because I want us to see, the Bible's not boring, by the way. If someone thinks the Bible's boring, you need to read it with a fresh set of eyes. It's not boring. It's okay to use your sanctified imagination when you read a passage like this. Because I'm pretty sure when Jesus healed this blind man, and it says he began praising God, he was following Jesus, that he did not say, oh, Thank you, Jesus. That was a really nice thing that you did to me. I'm going to follow you now. I'm pretty sure it didn't go down like that. You can, 
I'm, I'm trying to think what, I don't know, obviously I'm not blind, I do have uh, corrective lenses, what it would be like if all of a sudden I could see perfectly without my glasses. Or, uh, even more so, I don't feel like I did when I was 16 or 17 when I wake up in the morning, and I know you know what I'm talking about if you've aged a bit. If I woke up one morning and suddenly I felt like I did when I was 16 or something, I would probably be like, wow, that's awesome. But if I was blind and I asked Jesus to heal me, I want to regain my sight, and he did it, this is what I'm going to be doing. Yes! I don't know, exactly. What would you do? Maybe he fell on his face or something. I don't know what he, what he would do, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't some calm, reflective, that was really nice. Man, he'd be screaming and shouting, yes, yes, yes! Yes, and you would too. Imagine that. I don't know how long he'd been blind. I don't know how long he'd been dealing with this. But if he knew what it was like to see, as the text indicates, he knew what it was like to see, and some, somehow, some way, sometime he lost it. And now, in a dramatic encounter with Jesus, he's got it back. I'm pretty sure that dude is hyped. Woo! Man, I would be pumped! And so he does, he, he's, I mean, if you want to translate it that way, he was glorifying God. He was celebrating. He was passionate. And he began following him. He doesn't stay there by the side of the road begging. He's like, man, I'm with him. He healed me. Now, we're going to see under the second point that he knew something about who Jesus was. And so that's another reason why he would want to follow him. But it's amazing what God did here, and he, he says, okay, I'm a changed man now. Now I want to detour for just a minute and just talk about an issue that sometimes in our circles kind of just gets um, neglected. We don't talk about it a lot. It's uncomfortable. There's confusion about this. Sometimes there's even controversy about this. Um, I'm going to catch my breath first, though. Give me just a minute. We'll pause. We'll hit pause here for a second. All right, time out over. I want to talk about the issue of physical healing. This is an issue that as Baptists we often shy away from, and um, especially as Baptist pastors. There are certain topics as a Baptist pastor, you almost like, I don't know if it just comes with the territory, but you just feel this pull in your soul when it comes to that, don't talk about it, or just spiritualize it, don't talk about this issue, because if you do, you're going to stir up controversy or whatever. I, I, I loathe controversy. Don't desire to stir that up at all, but I am your pastor, and um, I do feel responsible when it comes to issues like this to teach on this, right? If it's here in the scripture, then let's teach on it. This is a complex issue, and I'm not going to dive super deep into the weeds this morning. Um, we're not going to develop a full biblical systematic theology of, uh, of healing this morning. And to be fair, there are a lot of differences uh, of views on this with uh, sincere, uh, well-intentioned, genuine, Bible-believing Christians sometimes differ on this issue. But what I want to do this morning is lay out a couple of ditches for you when it comes to this issue. I've shared many times that on lots of issues, there's two ditches. I'm thinking kind of engineer think, right? When I used to do roadway design, we would have what was called a typical section, and you would have a ditch on one side for drainage purposes and a ditch on the other side, and then you would have a road in the middle. And you want to drive on the road. You don't want to go in the right ditch. You don't want to go in the left ditch. You want to stay on the road. And so I'm going to bring out kind of two ditches opposite sides of this issue this morning. Somewhere, the answer is somewhere in the middle on the road. You don't want to be in a ditch. Both ditches are bad. So one potential ditch when it comes to this issue of healing is to implicitly assume, even if we don't state it, that somehow God just doesn't heal anymore as if somehow he's lost the ability to do that. My friends, that's hogwash. Has God lost the ability to do anything? Right? God hasn't lost any abilities God is unchanging. In fact, that's in a very important doctrine that we see throughout Scripture is that God is unchanging. And so God hasn't lost the ability 
to do anything. If God was able to heal in the first century and in the ages before that, then he's absolutely able to do that now because Jesus' power is not diminished in any way. I believe that to the core of my being, that Jesus' power is not diminished. In fact, in the present day, Jesus has been raised from the dead, friends. He's defeated death. And so that's for all time. So he certainly can heal. Now, I am not talking about the spiritual gift of healing and whether that gift is active or not. That's a separate issue, right? We're talking about spiritual gifts, and there's a, what they call a cessationist view that certain miraculous gifts have ceased or a continuing gift. We've talked about that before when I was in 1 Corinthians. That's not what I'm talking about this before. What I'm talking about is God's ability to heal. And think about it this way from a practical perspective. Why do we pray when people are encountering health issues? Are they just meaningless words that we just throw up to the ceiling? It, 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 are, are, is that why, why, why do we do that? If we don't actually believe that God is able to heal people, God can do that. Otherwise, we're wasting our time when we pray. I, I'll never forget, and, and again, I, I'm not, don't read too much into this because it's not some kind of I don't know what you might think of it, but I shared this before about two and a half years ago uh, when I was at Wanda Cole's bedside after she had had her first major stroke. And I remember visiting down with her at the hospital, and she had been pretty much unresponsive up to that point. Um, she was not, I mean, it, her, her son was there uh, with her, and, and there was obviously concern because she was not responding, and that, that's, that's not good, obviously, after a stroke. I didn't do anything dramatic. I didn't do some kind of, you know, you're healed or anything like that. I think we, we, we prayed. People, lots of people had been praying for her. And I remember I grabbed her hand, and I called her name, and she looked at me, and her face lit up. She recognized who I was, and got the biggest smile you can ever imagine. And I just started weeping. And I'm like, I don't know what in the world just happened here. I have no clue. And I don't know medically what you would say took place, but I know that she had been unresponsive. And at that very moment, God chose through whatever means he was using for her to, to sort of regain consciousness. And she recognized me. I'll never, I felt like I was in the book of Acts. I was like, what in the world is going on here? And I remember both... Brian, her son, and I were like, what? Uh, it's unbelievable. The counter to that would, would be for someone to say, and you would rightly observe this, yeah, but God often doesn't heal people. Many times he lets them stay sick, lets them stay disabled, or even lets them die. And in fact, you would be right in saying that. And that was the same in the first century when Jesus was walking around on the earth. Uh, do we think that Bartimaeus and his companion were the only blind beggars in Judea or, or that area? Of course not. There were probably tons of blind, deaf, and lame beggars and whatnot, and most of them were not healed. And even when it came to this issue with, with Wanda, that turned out to be temporary. I don't know why the Lord allowed what he did and did what he did, uh, but I know she recovered very briefly, and we had that little time with her, and then uh, ultimately, she, uh, she was gone within a few months, and it's, it's, it's tragic. I, my heart breaks when I think about it. Ultimately, if we want to zoom out, even when we're talking about physical healing, it's always temporary to some degree, right? I mean, you think about Lazarus who was raised from the dead in the book of John. It's not like you could travel over to Israel right now and you're going to see Lazarus, right? He was raised from the dead, and then eventually what happened to him? He died again. And so in this broken, fallen world, everything is temporary. My friends, this leads me to the second ditch. So if the first ditch is not believing that God still has the ability to heal, the second ditch is this. We have to be very careful to let God be God. We have to let God be God. God can do as He pleases. He sees everything. He knows everything. And he is in total control of every situation. I can ask things of him, but I absolutely cannot demand things of him. Right? He is the master. We are the servants. And so we must have a servant's heart and mentality. 
for some reason, for, for reasons that we may never know in this life, sometimes he allows people not to be healed. Sometimes he brings them home, though it may seem too early from that, for that uh, from our perspective. And friends, as a pastor ministering to others, I've wrestled with that many times in ministry. Well, God, why didn't you heal so-and-so? Why, why is so-and-so not getting better? Um, it's very hard to take. And we, we've seen that even recently in our midst. Um, I, I'm not trying to create a painful situation even by mentioning this, but when we lose someone that we care about who seems like they were way too young to pass away, um, I, it, the questions run through our head, why God? Why, why is it this way? Uh, it's very painful, friends. And that's where the second ditch becomes a real problem. We can't demand things of God. And if we take the position, as some folks do, that when we genuinely have faith, God will always heal us in this life, as if God responds to our commands, then the only conclusion that we could come to, logically, is that when someone is sick or they dies, there must be some deficiency in their faith or some major sin issue going on there. My friends, that is the error of Job's friends. And that's the error of the disciples when they encountered the man born blind in John. The, the disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was that way? And Jesus said, neither. It's, it's not like that. Actually, this was so that God could display his glory in his life. And so we must not do that. We, we, it, from a pastoral perspective, it's incredibly hurtful to think about someone who's sick or dying and to imply that somehow the reason that, that that is, it must be that there's some deficiency in your faith. That's like pastoral malpractice. Uh, I, I can't imagine saying that to someone. And so again, uh, we can create greater suffering through spiritual and emotional anguish. Now I can say this, that in eternity, my friends, he's going to wipe away every tear and we're going to have resurrection bodies. And that's amazing. I don't even know what that's going to be like. I'm sure it's got to be a lot better than this life, for sure. So the bottom line is this, and this is why I bring this up. When we pray for someone's healing, we should pray both with confidence that God is still able to do what he's, he's always been able to do, and at the same time we pray with humility, recognizing that we are not God. We're not God. And we must allow Him to do what is best from His big picture vantage point, which is not ours. That's hard. But my friends, we're called to trust the Lord. And so I, I, I know it's kind of a detour there. I do want to get back to our text. But when opportunities like this come up, I do want to teach on this some. Let's get to the second point this morning. That is spiritual sight. The blind beggar recognized Jesus even before he could see him with his eyes. The blind beggar recognized Jesus even before he could see him with his eyes. Now, I mentioned a while ago uh, that there was significance in how Bartimaeus addressed Jesus. Look back with me at verse 38. It says, And he called out, saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, those who are in the, the Bible Expo Sunday School class, alternately taught by Rob and Steve, uh, you, you know this because you've been in 2 Samuel recently. And so you're familiar with this. From 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, there's this Davidic covenant. And I'm going to summarize it here. It's, it's longer than just this, but we'll summarize it with verse 16. Uh, the prophet tells David, uh, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, it's doubtful, as multiple people from that class have talked to me about this issue, it's doubtful when David, King David, a thousand years before Jesus' earthly ministry, heard those promises, it's doubtful that he knew the full scope of what, he was, what was being promised to him. In David's mind, in all likelihood, he's thinking his son and his son's son and so on and the kingdom would just endure. However, that's not how history worked out. And so a few hundred years after the time of David, when David's descendants continually led the people into idolatry, 
God allowed the, the, the kingdom, that, that kingdom, the southern part, Judah, to be taken over. And David's line ceased. Now, there were descendants, of course, but they weren't ruling on the throne anymore because other empires took over under new management, so to speak. And so, from that point forward, people began seeing that promise in a different way. They began looking to the Messiah. Who's the one that's going to come back and assume the throne of David? When will someone come and take that role and fulfill that prophecy? So when the blind beggar addresses Jesus as the son of David, he's effectively calling Jesus the Messiah. He's saying, I know who you are, Jesus. Have mercy on me. So he he sees Jesus as others don't. Friends, if the rich young ruler would have understood this, then he would have given up everything and said, I'm going to follow Jesus. But the rich young ruler, instead, he clings to his possessions. Rich young ruler doesn't have the spiritual sight that the blind man has. Even the disciples, they did give up everything to follow Jesus, but they lacked spiritual sight in the sense that Jesus is telling them directly what's going to take place. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise on the third day. And you could paraphrase it to say there were crickets chirping. Because they don't, un- they don't get it. They're just like, oh, yeah, it's a nice day today. I'm like, what? Jesus just told you what was going to happen. And they're like, hey, what's for lunch? They, they, they literally don't understand what Jesus is saying. They la- they're lacking in spiritual sight. But Bartimaeus, this blind beggar, says, Jesus, son of David, I know who you are. Have mercy on me. And, and really, if you think about it, I'm not going to dwell on this today, but as I was uh, reviewing the sermon in the wee hours of the morning today, I, I'm thinking about this in terms of things we've already seen in Luke's Gospel. When Jesus went to Nazareth, He preaches in the synagogue and he quotes from Isaiah and he talks about sight being restored to the blind. When John the Baptist is in prison and he sends uh, some some folks to Jesus to say, are you really the promised one or should I be looking for someone else? Jesus again quotes from Isaiah and says, tell him that the blind now see. And so if Bartimaeus had familiarity with these things, maybe that's part of how Bartimaeus was able to connect the dots and say, he's the Messiah Therefore, he can restore sight to blind people. Jesus, give me my sight back. He saw in a different way. He had spiritual sight. Even the small details, we see some of this stuff. Like verse 41. What do you want me to do for you? And he, that is the beggar, said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Now, sometimes, to be fair, when you see Lord in Scripture, it just kind of is almost like saying, Sir. But many times people call Jesus teacher or rabbi, and here he calls him Lord. And if he recognizes that Jesus is the son of David, I would venture to to guess, just like many commentators said, that there's a lot more wrapped up in this Lord, I want to regain my sight, than just sir. Right? He's effectively calling Jesus Lord. And then in verse 42, we have this glorious statement, receive your sight, your faith has made you well. Literally, it says your faith has saved you. Much like the woman who had the hemorrhage back in Luke 8, Jesus very clearly says your faith has saved you. There is a spiritual significance to this. This man recognized who Jesus was. He yielded himself to him and then he began to follow him. This man had spiritual sight, friends. He was blind, but he saw. Friends, Jesus saves sinners. Jesus saves sinners. That is the glorious news of the gospel that we preach week by week by week by week. Every week we'll never stop preaching that. That Jesus Christ saves sinners. He was on the road to Jerusalem where he would yield his life willingly Though he could have stopped it in a moment, and he tells his disciples that, he willingly gave himself up. Though he had no sin of his own, he was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. He willingly yielded himself, gave himself up, died on a cross, not for his own sin because he had none, but so that others could be forgiven. 
Friends, that is the glorious news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ saves sinners. But Jesus did not stay dead. And friends, there we're going to talk about the healing issue. Jesus, as the ultimate trump card over, over death, he was raised from the dead. Well, what is, what's the significance of that? That means he's still alive. He has defeated sin and death. And that means that you and I can call on him today. What's today? December 3rd, 2023. You can call on Jesus and he is alive. He is not dead. And he still saves sinners. Friends, glorious news. Call upon Jesus. Jesus has compassion. I, I love, one of the reasons I love studying the Gospels is you just see some things about the character of Jesus. And you see the compassion that Jesus has. He was a busy guy. And he had lots of people pulling at him. I, I, I feel that sometimes. Lots of people pulling at you and you're like, I just don't have time for all this. Jesus made time. And he said, stop, stop the caravan here. Stop the parade you bring that guy here. What? Jesus, no, we got to keep moving. No, you stop it, and you bring that guy here. And he brings him, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? I want to regain my sight. Your faith has saved you. Friends, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus today? If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the hope that's found in Jesus, the gospel call is to repent and believe. Leave our life of sin behind And look to the Savior, who is so gracious, loves sinners, and he gives new life. Do you know, when the blind man was healed, the last verse in our passage, when he was healed, he glorified God, he followed Jesus, and then others began to glorify God as well. His his testimony of what took place in his life energized others so that they too would glorify God. Friends, is that our testimony? Do others, are others drawn to the Savior because of what God has done in our lives? Now, I'm not saying that you were physically blind and God healed you or something like that. But friends, if your faith has saved you, just like here with Bartimaeus, then you've got something to share. And others have reason to glorify God for the miracle that He did in your life and in mine. My friends, let's be like Bartimaeus and be testimonies of the grace of God to others who desperately need to hear the good news that Jesus Christ saves sinners. Sometimes I put it this way, if God can save me, He can save anybody. And it's true, friends. Let's praise Him together today. Let's pray. Glorious God, you are amazing beyond. Human words could never capture the fullness of your, the the wonder of you. We try and uh, we, we do the best we can with our lips, with our lives. And you're worthy of it for sure. But our modes of expression in this life are are just inadequate to fully convey how glorious You are. That Jesus, Your Son, would not only notice this beggar, but he, He would stop, call Him to Himself, Willingly grant him his request and receive him as one of his own. Oh God, you are amazing beyond beyond what we can convey. Lord, thank you that you still love sinners. You've not you've not changed in your abilities, you've also not changed in your love for sinners. And there's hope because of that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mm. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but
but now I see. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen.